show us this first part too. Okay. Okay, it's, uh, it's working there. Okay. Well, it's an honor to be here. I thank the organizers to be here for this very special occasion. Uh, and <laughs> now that ADS CFT is a strapping youth of 20, I thought I'd start by congratulating the proud parents. And this is a logo that nicely captures the yin and yang of ADS CFT. Uh, design actually is copyrighted to my former student, Johan Gunsch. But it so turns out that ICTP actually has produced uh, uh, T-shirts with this logo on it. And I thought that it would make a very good present for the MGKPW. But then like uh, ADS CFT, those T-shirts are also very popular. And we are just left with, there was only one T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> It's of the size that I think will fit Edward. So, <laughs> <laughs> so as for uh, for Juan and Igor and uh, Actually, Steve, as you saw, I wore one. Yes, right? and Sasha. Uh, uh, next time they visit the ICTP, there is a T-shirt waiting for you. Okay, so uh, what I would like to talk about is quantum holography. So much of the very nice talks we've heard and also a lot of the work that has gone on in holography is at large gen, which basically means use classical gravity to study strongly coupled CFT. But of course, one of the prime motivations for doing string theory was to learn about quantum gravity. And they correspond to finite end effects. And one can even ask the question to be completely uh, 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 does holography really hold at quantum level? And so unless one is a religiously fanatic, one should keep an open mind, maybe it is valid only at large end. And these are the two developments motivated by these questions about quantum holography that I have been pursuing for the last uh, five, six years. One is localization in supergravity, because if you want to study quantum holography, you need to develop new methods, non-perturbative methods for computing quantum gravity effects in the bulk. And the question is, can we make sense of the path integral of supergravity, at least for a suitably twisted version? And the another thing which kind of a surprise, an unexpected surprise that came out of this kind of investigation was a, a very precise connection to mock modular forms, which is again required by considerations of quantum holography in ADS-3 CFT2. So this is what I will try to describe. And rather than jumping to the latest thing I'm doing, I thought, I mean, even for this very select audience, uh, ADS CFT has grown so broad that not everybody would have followed this development. So I thought that I will give a broad s summary and sort of the recent developments on where the subject is going. And of course then talk a bit about our recent work. So this is based on uh, some of my collaborators which are listed here. And the, some of the work that I will describe is also based on two new students. Uh, and a postdoc at ICTP, and a large number of other people. Uh, I will try to reference them, but if, I, uh, if there is an omission, they're all included here. <laughs> <laughs> so localization, so supersymmetric path integral can be localized, as we know, to a finite dimensional integral over some supersymmetric saddle points using this argument of Witten that you know, basically a Grassmann integral is zero. And it has proved to be a very powerful tool for studying strongly coupled quantum field theories. And it has really developed over three decades, uh, starting with Witten's work, then there were works of Necrosso, Peston, in four dimensions, in three dimensions, in two dimensions. And every uh, few years, we have learned something really important and interesting about quantum field theory, which we could not have learned without these methods. Now, can we, the, so the goal is that can we really uh, try to emulate this in quantum gravity. And of course, in quantum gravity, this is fraught with danger. So one has to tread uh, carefully. But uh, basically, we sort of followed our nose and we have tried to develop these methods. And despite the difficulties, there has been steady progress. And my hope is that localization could prove to be as fruitful in quantum gravity as it has been in QFT as time develops and as more people and some of the younger people get interested in this. And a prototype example I would like to describe are n equal to 8 black holes. And then I will describe more general things. So uh, if you look at the 1-8 BPS states in n equal to 8 theory, type 2 against uh, T6, and a dionic charge vector QP, 
then the u duality invariant is q square p square minus q dot p square and the counting function for these half, uh, one eight bps states is given the index is given in terms of the fourier coefficients of this uh, object which is a theta function square divided by eta <coughs> to the 6 a very explicit object uh, and the degeneres uh, sorry the index is related to minus 1 to the d plus 1 of c of delta and the counting function is a jacobi form which uh, uh, means, uh, for those of you who the post ads CFT generation, uh, it's a modular, int I mean, it's basically very symmetric. Uh, it's doubly periodic in Z, and it behaves nicely under modular transformation. And already with the, you can see the power of quantum holography, because the near horizon geometry of a black hole, of that black hole, is ads 2 cross S2, and it naturally leads to ads 2 CFT1 duality. And following that, uh, Sen developed uh, um, uh, the path integral defined, the path integral W of delta in the near horizon geometry as a generalization of the world entropy. And it's a generalization in the, to the extent that it includes non-local effects coming from massless loops, which are essential for various nice properties of, the, uh, uh, of that object. And in this case, quantum holography implies two things. It implies W of delta must be equal to D of delta. <coughs> Now, that's a non-trivial prediction for the path integral because this tells you that the path integral must be an integer. And of course, we can do the, write this equation slightly differently and it implies therefore d of delta is equal to w of delta. <laughs> but it implies a non-trivial prediction for the index because the index, d of delta was an index and there is no natural reason why it should be positive. And it's a non-trivial prediction for the Fourier coefficients of that modular form or for an index because index is equal to degeneracy. This all follows from considerations of quantum holography. And this second uh, prediction you can immediately check. If you just look at the, put the modular form on a computer and look at the first few coefficients, they are all to satisfy this positivity. Uh, and you can also prove it. Now to go to the first prediction is much, it requires a lot more work. And uh, fortunately, using the modular properties, there is this beautiful formula due to Hardy, Ramanujan, and Rademacher which expresses this integer, this is analytic number theory, it expresses integers in terms of analytic objects. And that's precisely the kind of thing we need because we have a path integral, which is an analytic object. And it expresses it as a sum over Bessel functions with some non-trivial phases. And the Bessel function is just, you know, the fair, usual Bessel function, uh, well, it's a modified Bessel function with this integral representation. And in fact, if you identify z with the area upon 4, this Bessel function, the first term, c equal to 1, actually captures all the infinite perturbative corrections in 1 upon area and log of area are captured by the first term in this expansion. And then the second term captures non-perturbative effect. And our really ambitious goal is that can quantum holography, if Juan is really right, can we really compute it? <clears throat> And the Krustemann sums are actually even more intricate. They have rather intricate uh, phase structure, uh, which follows from number theory. And these are highly subleading phases, but they're essential for integrality. And therefore, you have to learn to deal with them. And quantum holography again requires that the bulk must reproduce these non perturbative phases. And as we will see, quite uh, remarkably, that it does. So the path integral on ADS2, if you include the M-theory circle, then it's basically like ADS2 cross S1. And there is a family of geometries which be asymptote to ADS2 to cross S1, which are labeled here by two integers. Okay. And they can be thought of as freely acting ZC orbifolds of this disk or the BTZ black hole. And they're related to the SN to Z family of ADS3 that were considered by various authors as a kind of a, a possible uh, source for non-perturbative contributions to the entropy. And what localization does is that it actually justifies, it was never clear how you could add subleading contributions in a non-perturbative expansion, but localization is what will justify that procedure, as we will see. So localization simply means that we, uh, you have some integral which is uh, invariant under supersymmetry, and uh, the whole integral collapses to a solution of that supersymmetry, sort of the BPS configurations of that supersymmetry. And those we were able to solve, find, using n equal to 2 supergravity coupled to nv vector multiplets. 
and they have a particularly simple form. They are completely universal solutions, independent of the physical action, and they follow purely from optional supersymmetry transformations. And these parameters ci are to be integrated <coughs> over, so your entire path integral collapses to an integral over these integers. Sorry, these are real numbers. And if you now look at the renormalized action for the pre-potential f, it takes this very nice form. It can be expressed very simply in terms of this and very reminiscent of the OSV conjecture uh, from the 2004. Uh, and I will comment later upon that. And essentially then the path integral reduces to a Bessel integral with a reasonable ansatz for the measure, which we sort of made an ansatz at the time when we were doing it. But I will come back to the major issue in a moment, uh, uh, towards the end. Uh, and if you do that, you get exactly the Bessel function that we were after. And not only that, uh, it's easy to see that the subleading Bessels will also follow uh, by looking at evaluating these uh, saddle points on this topologically uh, uh, non-trivial, uh, I mean, these other geometries labeled by C. So all the, the entire structure follows very nicely. Uh, what remains are the Klusterman sums, and that sort of stopped us for a while. And it turns out, uh, uh, when my uh, uh, Joao Gom, she realized that the churn salmons terms in the bulk uh, are sensitive to the global properties of MCD. So these localization solid uh, instant terms are completely local, meaning they follow from uh, solving a differential equation, and they are insensitive to the topology. But the churn salmons terms in the bulk, uh, ADS uh, 2 cross S1 or ADS 3 bulk, are sensitive to the global properties, and they contribute additional saddle points which are specified by the holonomies of flat connections. And you just follow again the uh, procedure they're closely related to knot invariance and lens space, which were uh, studied earlier. But, and you just follow your uh, the uh, literature in churn salmons theory, and you evaluate them. There are various uh, uh, gauge groups in the problem. There is a U1, SU2 left, SU2 right. And they all beautifully assemble uh, into the churn salmons action uh, terms, phases, assemble into <coughs> this uh, very nice formula. So now let me, uh, before now going into the new things that have been, uh, that I would like to talk about, uh, some of the other things, let me just take uh, stock of what has been achieved in terms of quantum holography and localization. Because these were, there were a number of issues which were very puzzling in the community and there were all kinds of confusions. But I think one by one, we have resolved many of them. First of all, there was a confusion about whether uh, we are computing an index and how can we compare that with the degeneracy. That is now understood in a, by ADS2 quantum holography, index is equal to degeneracy. We have shown path integral is equal to Bessel integrals. Or before Saddles give you Hardy Ramanujan Rademacher. Chern Simons gives you Klusterman. And then uh, we had looked at only the supersymmetric F terms, but uh, uh, some recent work by Devitt and Murthy shows that the D terms are equal to zero. So I think everything, uh, all the assumptions that we had made along the way, R can be justified now much better. One of the open problems that remains, which I think is an important one, is the computation of the measure from first principle. Because, for example, this is when you do localization, you have to compute one loop determinants around this saddle point. And in gravity, the problem is quite complicated because you have to, first of all, set up a background field quantization in supergravity, which was not done. And the BRST uh, formalism is rather complicated because it's a soft algebra. Uh, so technically, it was a kind of a challenging problem. And this is, a, again, work to appear. This is a, a private communication. But I think uh, these people have made what looks to me to be very nice progress. <coughs> and they have set up the BRST formalism for the background field quantization in supergravity. And then you can compute the determinant. So I think now uh, localization in supergravity is sort of coming to a level maybe one can uh, not yet, but I, um, that's my hope that it will eventually in this coming year or so, it will be there. Then there is a very interesting question about duality invariance because uh, you can distribute the charges differently uh, with the same duality invariance and they appear, the, this calculation, differently. And it's not at all obvious a priori that the answer will be duality invariant. Uh, and what uh, uh, Gomshi realized that actually the dual duality invariance implies non-trivial number theoretic identities like Selberg identity for the Klusterman sum. And it would be, a, it's a very interesting problem to obtain them from the bulk, again, by considerations of this Chern-Simons phases. 
uh, he, he has made some progress in that direction, but I think, again, it's a problem that requires uh, further uh, work. Then how do you get the subleading Bessel functions? That problem also, for example, in n equal to 4, that problem also has been now recently addressed by Gom, Shan, Murthy, and Reyes. Uh, and uh, they come from the instantons of the topological string. OK, so uh, let me now uh, quickly summarize how much time do I have? <laughs> I was counting on you being as uh, gentle as you were yesterday. <laughs> okay, so let me, uh, okay, if I can take maybe a few, few minutes extra. Uh, so the path integral, what is I think as surprising uh, from the, the path integral, which is a complex analytic object, yields an integer. And it accounts for uh, all kinds of non perturbative I mean, it accounts for the non perturbative states, which are actually whose mass is higher than the string scale. So in this sense, it's really an IR window into the UV. And if you, uh, there are generalizations that one can consider, and it really uh, uh, calls for some kind of topological supergravity along the lines of what Sparks and Wafa also mentioned in their talks. Uh, okay, maybe I will come to this uh, transparency towards the end. This was a kind of more philosophical comment, which I'll come to the end if there is time. Now let's go to the n equal to four um, uh, meromorphic Jacobi. So in n equal to four, the counting function turns out to be a meromorphic Jacobi form. So if you remember, our counting function was theta square upon eta to the six. Here, this theta square is in the denominator rather than in the numerator. And that means it has poles. So Fourier coefficients now depend on the contour. Which one should we choose? It will give you a different answer. The contours move around under modular transformation. And therefore, modular symmetry is lost. And this really bothered me because, uh, again, because of considerations of holography, because uh, ADS3 requires that there should be a modular symmetry, because this modular symmetry can be identified with the modular symmetry of the boundary torus. So the loss of modularity would have been a disaster for uh, holography, and I didn't see any way of restoring it. And it turns out, uh, talking to a number theorist, Zaghi, about this, it turned out that his student had solved that problem. Uh, going back to Ramanujan's work from 100 years ago. Uh, and that led us to a, co a collaboration, and it led to this decomposition theorem that I will now uh, uh, describe. So um, what we proved was that a meromorphic Jacobi form has a canonical decomposition, uh, psi m finite and psi m polar. This is called a mock Jacobi form, which has no poles. And all the poles are residing here. And they are called the apple lurk sum in the maths literature. And you can think of them as basically some kind of an elliptic average of the, there is a pole and you just average over on a torus, you have a, on a plane, you just average over it. Uh, and the, uh, then the, the contour depends on the moduli in a precise way and the moduli space, space splits into chambers consistent with duality. And there's a very beautiful physical interpretation in terms of black holes that uh, there are walls in the moduli space on the left hand side there are single centered black holes, on the right hand side there are single centered and double centered black holes. And the mock Jacobi form counts the single centered black holes, the apple lurk sum counts the multi centered black holes, pole crossing corresponds to wall crossing, and residue corresponds to the jump in the degeneracy. And the non trivial part of our theorem uh, was that the mock Jacobi form, I mean, of course, you can always divide a function in this way. Uh, the non-trivial part of the uh, mock modularity is that that Jacobi form admits a modular completion, which means that by adding a small piece to it, you can make it modular, but that piece is non-holomorphic, and therefore that completion is denoted with a hat. It satisfies a holomorphic anomaly equation. And of course, uh, Rama, the, the reason they were mysterious, because Ramanujan did not tell us anything about this holomorphic anomaly, he just divined the mock modular forms, and they said, <laughs> from the goddess of Namagiri, and he said that uh, they have nice modular properties. But now we can actually verify them. We, if we add a correction term, then we can actually verify that the modular form is. So mock Jacobi forms, therefore, are holomorphic but not modular, and the modular completion is modular but not holomorphic. So there is this uh, tension between these two things, uh, between holomorphy and modularity. And again, it looks mysterious, but now I will discover that there's a very simple physical uh, derivation of it, which I will describe in, a, uh, in two uh, final slides. Uh, but basically, this analysis of the DMZ paper uh, led to, uh, we analyzed all these infinite family of meromorphic Jacobi forms, 
with double poles and a related family with single poles. And basically, they yield most mock modular forms known to humankind. Going all of Ramanujan's examples, the generating function of Hurwitz Kronecker, which was studied by Zagier, the new forms that appeared in Umbral Moonshine, and infinite class of new examples. So it's a kind of a nice uh, bonus that comes out of considerations of quantum holography. But then the question is, can we really uh, take holography seriously and derive this mock modular form and the shadow uh, from the near horizon geometry? So this is uh, the one thing that we realized in the, this process is that mock modularity is closely related to non-compactness. And if you're computing an elliptic genus of a 0, 2 SCFT with a compact target, then you get a Jacobi form. But if it is compact, then there is a famous argument of Witten that the Bose-Fermi cancel on, in pairs, the right-moving Bose-Fermi cancel in pairs, and you get the left-moving, right-moving ground states and left-moving oscillations. But if the, non, if the M is non-compact, the spectrum is continuous, and then the Bose-Fermi cancellation may not be exact because the density of states of, of the continuum may not be precisely matched. And in this case, the elliptic genus so defined would be non-holomorphic. And that basically is the interpretation of uh, um, uh, mock modularity from the point of view of non-compactness. And uh, now going to holography, we know what should be the near horizon uh, non-compact CFT. And our, uh, if you just look at the attracted equations, the, the near horizon geometry of the brain system has a non-compact Taubnut space uh, with a factor whose uh, radius squared is equal to m. And the, it's very easy to see that the lattice sum of this asymptotic circle gives precisely this term, which is the shadow. And uh, the density of states can be computed using scattering theory. And uh, we have not completely dotted the i's yet, but the following these ideas, one can really provide a physical derivation of the holomorphic anomaly, and therefore a physical derivation of Mach modularity. And once again, it is inspired by holography because uh, without holography, we would not have gone down this track. And this is some work that I, I will describe, uh, I mean, that, that will come out soon. So I think, I, do I have time for two philosophical transparencies? <laughs> okay, this goes back to the discussion that uh, happened, that is quantum gravity dual or emergent? And I think there are two points of views that were expressed. I think this, this I would say, is the old school the pre-ADS-CFT uh, point of view that ADS quantum gravity is exactly dual to CFT. Uh, M-theory has its own rules of computations with an as yet unknown non perturbative formulation. And it's just a special corner of some platonic elephant of M-theory that we don't know. Uh, and the second point of view, which is I think much more popular nowadays, is that ADS quantum gravity is just emergent from CFT. Uh, and any reasonable CFT gives a non perturbative definition. I mean, we don't yet know what exactly is reasonable, but that's the kind of belief that it will give you a non perturbative definition of quantum gravity. And of course, my color coding here is not entirely uh, impartial, <laughs> <laughs> but I would say that our competition seem to argue in favor of one. And the theory is really not just UV complete, but UV rigid. Uh, and since it's a little bit of a contrarian point of view, let me say why I think so. For example, in this ADS2 examples, all integers d of delta define a valid CFT1. But only a very sparse set among them has a dual ADS2. So the rest of them are in some kind of a swamp land. <laughs> only those uh, which come from um, uh, Fourier coefficients of a modular form actually correspond to uh, a proper ADS2 dual. Moreover, we have independent rules for computing the W of delta. You know, we did not rely on some rewriting of the CFT and then trying to interpret it as gravity. We just said there is a definition of semi-classical quantum gravity. So any, anywhere, whenever we have non-perturbative, we claim to have a non-perturbative dual of a CFT, we should check whether the bulk has semi-classical rules of quantum gravity and whether whatever answers we get agree. And what we saw was that uh, W delta equal to D delta really required some precise details of M theory, and uh, such as churn simons terms. So from that point of view, I would argue that this is the point of view that I would take, that this is the elephant of the M theory. This is just the left ear. ADS CFT is just the left ear of this elephant. And Which is a mammoth. So, uh? Which is a mammoth. No? It's a mammoth. And my personal bias is to believe that if the left ear is there, then there is a bigger beast attached to it. 
and uh, the left ear of the beast is not the whole beast. But okay, I mean, this is a, uh, I will stop there. I think this is a good point. <laughs> n equals 8, yeah. written in n equals 2 formalism, which also contains yeah. hypermultiplex. Yes, yes. Now, doesn't that require to understand off-shell hypermultiplex? So, uh, this is the issue that I talked about measure, is that first of all, we know from the attractor mechanism that the hypermultiplex are not uh, excited, so we don't expect them to uh, modify the instantons, but they can contribute to one-loop determinants. And to study that problem, uh, I think linearized off-shell, uh, you just require a one-loop uh, uh, analysis. And this is an issue that uh, these people have tried to address. And uh, uh, my belief, I mean, it's not yet completely done, but my belief is that we, sh we would be able to address that issue. I have a related question. So if I understand correctly, the, this, uh, solutions you, these configurations you integrate over are not, are not solutions. Right? They are not solutions of the equations. Yeah, no, no. Like in any localization right, situation. Right. So that I, I thought that in order to compute something like the graviton determinant, you need to to have a solution of equations. Ah, uh -huh, very good. So that's related to yeah. So so that was one. It's a, there is a conceptual question. How do we even set up? Uh, which I don't have a full understanding of. Uh, how do you even set up uh, uh, localization in gravity? Because uh, the Q supersymmetry is supposed to be uh, gate symmetry. So what, what exactly does it mean? And the one way to set it up is that you split the graviton into the back, use the background field method as we do. So you have a background field, like background, you have a background field plus quantum fluctuations. Then you choose a gauge for the background field and then you choose a gauge for the, and so you develop the whole VRST for both these gate symmetries independently. And then what you find is that at the end of it, you're left with uh, asymptotic, part of the gate symmetry is left over, which is what you use for doing the localization. So basically now you have an ADS to background field, which is completely well defined, there is no, and the quantum field is fluctuating in that background, uh, but which asymptotes to ADS2, and you choose that uh, asymptotic ADS2 to define the uh, uh, localization in the background metric. So that's I think that's the way DeWitt and these people have tried to solve this problem. I have not fully gone through their work, but I think it's, that seems to be, to be the right direction to develop. Okay, let's thank uh, Takish again.